Let's go ahead, let's start with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into God's word. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to study your word and just to show how much we love you by uh, taking seriously your word and studying it seriously. I just ask that you would incline our heart to your word and not to the things of this world, that you would open our eyes to behold wonderful things from your law uh, and illuminate our eyes so that we can understand your truth. Um, Please help us to not just be hearers of the word, uh, but to be doers of the word, to be men and women who are transformed by the power of the of your word. We pray all these things, and in Jesus' name, amen. So it's a unique opportunity to be able to preach just one time instead of week after week. Uh, You get to pick any topic that you want. Uh, So that's kind of a unique opportunity. So how do you choose? And what I did is I kind of looked back at impactful moments in my walk with the Lord and what has had great impact on me. And one of the biggest biblical truths that has impacted me probably the greatest, is the glory of God seen in his compassion by working for his people. So that's kind of what I want to talk with you about today. The glory of God in his compassion and love shown by his working on behalf of his people. So when you talk about the glory of God, that can be kind of a nebulous, you know, Christianese type thing. What does that mean? What is the glory of God? What does that mean? But glory is just magnificence. So it's just beauty seen, greatness that is seen. So the glory of God is his greatness, who he is as a person, his character, and the greatness of his character seen. Another way that you might word the glory of God is his uniqueness. So what separates God? What makes God magnificently stand out from other quote-unquote deities or from humanity, or from the rest of his creation? What is it that makes God magnificently great? What about his character, who he is as a person? And there's a lot of directions that you could go with that. I picked up Stephen Shamek's book on the attributes of God. Uh, It's 1,152 pages describing his attributes and his glory. So you could talk about his omniscience, his omnipotence, his omnipresence, his transcendence, his immutability, um, and all of these con- contribute and are a part of his glory, uh, but we don't have time to go into all of those. Uh, I t- was told, someone reminded me before I got up here, that as a guest speaker, it's better to go short than long. Uh, so I'll, I'll stick to that. Uh, what we're going to hone in on is one aspect of God's glory, and that is his compassion or his love. And that's shown to us by his working on our behalf. So what we're going to do tonight, we're going to spend a few minutes going through a few passages. We're going to start in the Old Testament. Um, We're going to look at what makes God unique. What is God's glory as seen in the Old Testament? What if his character sets him apart from the other deities or from humanity? And we'll start in the Old Testament, then I'll work our way into the New Testament. I thought since I might only have one chance to preach, I better do the whole Bible. Uh, So that's what we're going to do today. And then we'll spend the second half talking about how we should respond to the glory of God. So I hope that we see the glory of God, and then we'll talk about how do we respond once we've seen that glory. James 1 says, Don't just be hearers of the word who delude themselves, but be doers of the word. It isn't enough to just learn and study and just get all this knowledge into your head. Okay, here's God's glory. Great. Uh, that's, if all you do is pack your head with information, uh, it's really a waste of time. That needs to be work out in transformation in our life. So that's what we're going to look at a little bit. So let's go ahead and get started. Open up your Bibles, if you would, to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 64 is where we're going to start in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 64. And again, we're looking for what makes God unique. What sets him apart? What is his glory as seen in the Old Testament? So Isaiah chapter 64, verse 1. Isaiah says, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence. As fire kindles the brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. For from days of old they have not heard or perceived by ear, nor has the eye seen a God besides you, 
who acts in behalf of the one who waits for him. So Isaiah 64, verse 1, this is a prayer of Isaiah. And what he says there in verse 1, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. So Isaiah feels like the Lord is far off, that he's at a distance. So his prayer here in verse 1 is, Please come down. You feel like you're far off. Rend the heavens, split open the heavens, and come down. And Isaiah knew as well as we did that God is omnipresent. So Isaiah knew, just like we do, that in reality, he is not far off. Uh, He's not in heaven and we need him to come down. Isaiah knew that. What he's praying, though, he's praying for what many of the Puritans like to call the manifest presence of the Lord. Many Old Testament prayers pray for the manifest presence. So, Lord, we know that you're here with us, you're omnipresent, but it doesn't seem like you are. So please come down and manifest your presence. Show that you are here right now. Do something here and now in a way that's a visible way so that your presence is known. That's what Isaiah is praying for. Isaiah, if you remember the context of Isaiah, he's writing at a time after the northern tribes were taken into captivity into Assyria, and the southern tribes are currently in rebellion. And it looks like they're going to be taken into captivity soon too if they don't repent. So it's a bleak time for Israel. So Isaiah prays. You're here, but it doesn't look like you're here. It doesn't seem like you're here. It seems like there's a barrier between us. Rend the heavens and come down and act for your people. Verse 1. Then verse 2, it says, As fire kindles the brushwood, as fire causes water to boil. So God, please come down and work in a visible way and affect things the way that fire affects things. So when when fire comes into contact with brushwood, Or you put a pot of water on a flame and it starts to boil. No one asks, well, is the fire doing something? Is the fire acting? It obviously is. The brushwood is consumed in flame. The water's boiling. You can tell there's fire and it is potent and it's acting. You can see it. Its presence is manifested. So Isaiah's praying, Lord, the same way that fire boils water, turns brushwood into ash, manifest your presence in a way that is obvious to everyone. Specifically, verse 2, to make your name known to your adversaries. So it seems like God's enemies have the upper hand. It seems like God's not doing anything and his adversaries are winning. So make yourself known to your adversaries that the nations, that the whole world may tremble at your presence. Verse 3, when you did awesome things which we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence, so you've done this before. You've acted in a way visible to everyone. Uh, he's done that. Did it many times in Israel's history. You can think as uh, when they part the Red Sea, all the nations heard about God parting the Red Sea, and they feared Israel. They heard God had acted for His people in a visible way. His presence was manifested to the whole world. So, verse four. Here's where we get to the uniqueness of God. Uh, verse four. It says, for from days of old they have, they have heard, they have not heard or perceived by ear, nor has the eye seen a God besides you. So we're talking about God's uniqueness. Ever since creation, from days of old, no one has ever heard of a God like this with their ears or seen a God like this with their eyes besides you. So this is, this is God's uniqueness. This is the uniqueness of Yahweh compared to the other gods. No one's heard of a God like this. In the end of verse 4, what is it that makes God unique? Verse, end of verse 4, it says, For from days of old they've never not heard or perceived by ear, nor has the eye seen a God besides you. And this is what makes him unique, who acts in behalf of the one who waits for him who acts or works, that's the same, same word there, the, no one has ever seen a God who works on behalf of those who wait for him. What people are used to seeing, how all the other gods, small g, operate, and how all powerful humans, you think of kings and emperors, uh, how all of these rulers and deities operate is, I have power and might, so you come and serve me. You come and work for me, act for me. That's how all the other religions in the world function. I'm your God, you come do things for me. 
Do things and you might win my approval if you do enough things. And powerful humans function that same way. The more power someone gets, the more workers they acquire. Now you do this for me and you do this for me. And that's what we consider power to be. In fact, we often define power by how many people do you have doing things for you? How many people are working for you? Imagine a king with ultimate power. He has someone, you know, feeding him and fanning him, and he just sits on the throne all day. Everyone else does all the work for him. And that's power from the world's perspective. But the uniqueness of Yahweh, of our God, his glory, is that he in reality is the most powerful being. He has all power, all majesty, all dominion. He could legitimately tell anyone, do things for me. He could legitimately say that for anyone. But our God's unique. He is not looking for workers. He's not looking for people to do things for him. All other gods say, you work for me. But Yahweh comes to sinful humanity uh, and says, you cannot work for me. You don't have anything to offer me. Psalm chapter 14 says, Yahweh's look down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there's any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become useless. Yahweh comes to that type of people and says, you cannot work for me. All your righteous deeds are like filthy rags. So I'll show my greatness by working for you. I'll do things for you. God flips everything on its head. Uh, again, instead of us working for him, he works for us. And if you think about it, uh, the nature of working for someone is that they need help. Right? That's why we need workers. If you're lacking something, I need this done, so you work for me to get it done. Acts 17.25, God is not served by human hands as if he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people, life and breath and all things. So God doesn't need help. He doesn't need workers. That would be a sign of deficiency. But he's lacking something. Uh, in reality, he is so strong and so powerful that he works for people. Turn to Isaiah chapter 46. Isaiah chapter 46. Again, we're going to compare God, what makes him unique, what sets him apart from these other gods here. Isaiah chapter 46, uh, verse 1. Bel has bowed down, Nebo stoops over. Their images are consigned to the beasts and the cattle. The things that you carry are burdensome, alone for the weary beast. So, verse 1 of Isaiah 46, we have Bel and Nebo. And these are Babylonian gods that Israel was worshiping. So again, we're talking about the uniqueness of Yahweh. What sets him apart from Bel and Nebo, these idols that Israel was worshiping? And what he says there in verse 1 is that these idols, Bel and Nebo, uh, they have to be carried. It says they're burdensome. They have to be put on beasts to carry around. If you want to move it, you have to put it on top of a cow to move this god around. And there's a wordplay here. I don't know if you caught it, but it says, Bel has bowed down, Nebo has stooped over. And there's kind of a wordplay here, uh, because when you're moving these idols, you can't set them up right on the animal, or else they'll topple over. I should have brought an uh, illustration or something, but I'm not quite as technically literate as Gil, um, so I didn't. Uh, don't tell him I said that, by the way. Uh, but they couldn't set them upright on these animals, so they would have to lay them down to sit on these animals to move them. And this laying down of Bel and Nebo to move them around is symbolic of their weakness. They are bowing down in weakness. The fact that you have to move them around shows how weak these idols really are. These idols end up becoming burdens. Uh, they have to be carried around. They need workers to move them even. Verse 2, They stooped over Bel and Nebo. They bowed down together. They could not rescue the burden, but have themselves gone into captivity. So when the northern tribes were taken into captivity, their gods, Bel and Nebo, these idols, did they help them? Not at all. They were taken into captivity right with Israel. Uh, they didn't help at all. 
So now the northern tribes are in captivity in a foreign land, and now your God is also in captivity in a foreign land. So now you have to rescue yourself, get out of captivity, and then don't forget to rescue your God before you leave. Can't, can't leave your God there. That's not comforting to have a God like that. That's burdensome. They need workers. They are weak. They have deficiencies. So how is God different? Verse 3. And that's Bel and Nebo, verse 1 and 2. Verse 3. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel. You have been born by me from birth and have been carried from the womb. Even to your old age, I will do be the same, and even to your graying years, I will bear you. I have done it, I will carry you, I will bear you, and I will deliver you. Notice the contrast there. Other gods want you to bear them and to carry them. Verse 3, Yahweh doesn't want you to bear him and to carry him. He says, I have borne you from birth. I've carried you ever since you were born. In verse 4, even to your old age, I will continue to carry you, to bear you. I have done it. I will bear you. I will deliver you. You don't show your strength by working for me. I show my strength by working for you. I show your weakness, your need, and my strength by working for you. In verse 5, to whom would you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we would be alike? Down in verse 9, remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. This sets Yahweh apart. I've carried you in the past. I will carry you going forward. I will do it. You can do nothing. Every other religion, again, uh, is a burden. Work enough for me and I'll give you something. I was studying a little bit just the different religions of the world. They're all, you do something for me and then you get something. You get 70 virgins, or you get nirvana, or you get a greater, higher caste when you're reincarnated. You just make sure that you do your part. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. That's how these other religions work. That's a burden. Trying to do enough to earn these God's favor. Yahweh is not a burden. He is a burden bearer. All other religions demand performance. Yahweh offers performance to us. And really, it's a good deal for us. We get the help. God gets the glory. And that's, I think, how we want it. The one who does the rescuing is obviously greater than the one who needs to be rescued. So God comes down to serve and work on behalf of his people. So, Yahweh is unique in that he works for his people instead of having them work for him. God works for his people. What work has he done for us? Again, there's a lot of different directions that we could go with that. He's done a lot of things for us. He's worked a lot of things for us. He created us. He sustains us. He provides for us. But what is the main work that God performs for us? What is the greatest burden that he has borne for us? Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. The Lord, Yahweh, has laid on him, his son, the iniquities of us all. Isaiah 53, 11, My servant, the Messiah, will justify the many. He will bear their iniquities. So God is unique in that he works for his people instead of the other way around. And the greatest work that he has performed for us is taking care of our sin, pardoning our sin. Last Old Testament passage-ish. Uh, turn to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55. Verse 8. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my, your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So God is different than other gods, and God is very different than humans. His thoughts are infinitely higher than our thoughts. God says, I don't think the same way that you think. And you might have heard this verse quoted before, but what's the context? What is it that God thinks differently about? 
Look at, let's back up. We want to see what is he talking about there. Look at verse 7. Start in verse 6 of Isaiah 55. It says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord. And he will have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. So the context of what makes God, what separates him from people, is the way he handles the wicked. It's the way he handles people who have wronged him. The wicked, the unrighteous. How he handles those types of people. It says, let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts, and God will abundantly pardon him out of compassion on his enemies. So what separates God from other gods and from you and me here in Isaiah 55 is his compassion on his enemies. And you just think about when someone wrongs us, sinful human nature, when we are wrong, someone does something terrible to us, uh, compassion is not our natural response. We don't respond in compassion. We respond usually in hatred. Well, I'm going you know, to make sure to get them back. Even though when someone sins, it's mainly an offense against God, we still get indignant and offended and upset with that person. That's us. Those are our thoughts. His ways are higher. When he is wronged, his thoughts are not, I'm going to get even with that person. His thoughts are compassion for the wicked wanting to work on their behalf, wanting to pardon their sin. That's his nature. That's the, who God is. That's his character. Ezekiel thirty-three eleven, God says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. We take lots of pleasure in the destruction of our enemies. God says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I would prefer they turn and live. I want to work for them. 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 1 Timothy 2, 4, he desires, this is what God desires, is that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So when you look At the heart of God, as revealed in Scripture, and you see who he is as a person, what's there is compassion for his enemies. People wrong him, sin against him, and in his heart there is compassion and love. He desires to show his power by working on their behalf, working for them. He desires to rescue them. So, from the Old Testament, God's uniqueness, his glory, is that he works He pardons sin out of compassion on his enemies, on sinful people. You and me being one of those sinful people that he's worked on behalf of. Completely different than you and me or any other human or any other deity. So that's the Old Testament. Let's let's go to the New Testament. That's just a brief uh, Old Testament. The New Testament, let's go to the New Testament. In the New Testament, we get a clearer picture of God's glory. So we have even more revelation, more clarity in fact, 1 Peter says that the Old Testament, the prophets, were really serving you. So even the Old Testament was written for our benefit. The prophets spoke about God working for his people and the Messiah bearing sins and God showing compassion and pardoning sin. Uh, but they didn't understand with clarity how this would all work together. How can a just God overlook sins? How can he pardon sins? How can God be holy and righteous and also show compassion on unrighteous people? The Old Testament saints didn't understand this fully. So we get clarity in the New Testament. We see more of God's picture, more of his glory. And specifically, uh, where we get the most clarity in the New Testament, where we see the most of God's glory, we see the most of his uniqueness, the most clear picture of his compassionately working on behalf of his enemies, is in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ brings everything into focus, gives us clarity to see God's glory. Turn to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 
Verse 1. It says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways. So in the past, God has revealed himself in many different ways. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, in visions, he appeared to Isaiah in a vision. He appeared to Daniel in a vision and in a dream. He appeared to Moses in a burning bush. So long ago, God spoke in many different ways. He's revealed himself in many different ways. Verse 2, in these last days, long ago he's spoken in many portions and in many ways. In these last days, he's spoken to us in his Son. So in the last days, he's spoken to us in his Son. And the book of Hebrews is going to lay out, for the rest of the book really, how this Son, Jesus Christ, is better than everything that came before. He's a clearer picture of who God is. Verse 3 it says, and he, talking about the Son, Jesus Christ, he is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature. So Jesus Christ is the most clear picture of who our God is. God is invisible, of course. So when he wants to reveal himself, he shines a little bit of his glory into creation. He shines some of his glory in the Old Testament. But when he wants to shine the radiance of his glory, the fullness, the exact representation of his nature, he shines in a son. Jesus Christ is that son. Here is my glory. Jesus Christ. John 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The word was God. Verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten from the Father, he, talking about Jesus Christ, has explained him. So if you want to know Yahweh, our God, you want to see his character, you want to see his nature, uh, you want to see his glory, you look at Jesus Christ. He, is, he explains the Father. He is the radiance of the Father's glory and the fullness of his glory. So what is the glory of God when you look at Jesus Christ as laid out in the Gospels particularly? What is the radiance of his glory? And I taught through the book of John for, for three years in the, in the college group. Uh, Jesus Christ as the radiance of the glory of God. And I don't know about you, but before studying the book of John, when I thought of glory, what would come into my mind is I would think about you know, lights shining and thunder and lightning flashing to earth and power and 12 legions of angels. And I you know, saw the Lord lofty and exalted with the train of his robe filling the temple and seraphim flying around shouting, holy, holy, holy. Uh, and the whole earth is filled with his glory. When I thought of the glory of God, that is the first picture that came into my mind. But when God wants to display the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature to humanity, he doesn't thunder down to earth with 12 legions of angels. That's man's idea of power and glory. When God wants to display his glory, he does the opposite. He suns the radiance of his glory humbly in the lowest possible position, born in a manger. He comes full of grace and truth. That's what God wants to most fully communicate about himself. This is who I am. Turn to Mark chapter 10. Let's look at Jesus in his life. Mark chapter 10. So verse 32, they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking on ahead of them, and they were amazed. And those who followed were fearful. And again, he took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, Behold, we're going to go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him, and three days later he will rise again. So Jesus tells his disciples, this is what's going to happen to me. Verse 35, the disciples missed the point. 
Uh, Verse 35, James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, Jesus just said, I'm going to be crucified. They came up to him and said, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want for me to do for you? They said to him, grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left in your glory. So we want the most prominent positions. And we're going to skip ahead a little bit just for time. But Jesus basically tells them, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're asking for. And in verse 41, hearing this, the ten began to feel indignant with James and John. And why is that? It's because they wanted the most prominent positions. So we see here man's idea of glory. is We want to get on top. We want to have the most power. We want to get everyone else underneath us and have people work for us. But Jesus is going to use this as a teaching opportunity. Verse 42. Calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. So the world, natural humans, see glory as who is the highest, who has the most people underneath them. It's exactly the way the disciples were thinking. Verse 43, he says, But it is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave to all. So if you want to shine the brightest, if you want the most glory, if you want to be the highest, become the lowest. The glory of God is in compassion and humility, serving other people. Going low is where glory is found. Verse 45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So that's what Jesus came to demonstrate. He says, Even the Son of Man. Remember, Son of Man's Jesus' favorite title for himself, but even God himself. Sometimes we forget who Jesus Christ is. John chapter 8, Jesus says, Before Abraham was, I am. I am Yahweh. John chapter 12, we don't have time to go there. But John quotes from Isaiah 6. Remember, Isaiah 6 is where I saw the Lord lofty and exalted. The train of his robe was filling the temple, and the seraphim were shouting. John, in uh, John 12, John quotes from Isaiah 6 and says, that was the pre-incarnate Christ. That was Jesus Christ who Isaiah saw there. That's who says here in verse 45, even Yahweh himself, even the Son of Man, did not come to be served, but to serve. This is his glory. Again, this is exactly what we saw in the Old Testament. The glory of God is not in him being served, but in him serving, working for his people. And we could look all through Jesus' life to see this. Fast forward um, to the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday. What the Jews wanted more than anything is they wanted their Messiah to ride into Jerusalem on a white horse and take out the Romans. We want some power from our Messiah. Jesus, Palm Sunday, rides into Jerusalem But he's not on a white horse. He's on a donkey. And we don't have to guess why he was on a donkey. Matthew 21, 4 tells us, it says, This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, Zechariah. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you gentle. That's the word for humble, lowly, and mounted on a donkey. Even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The glory of God is seen in his humility, even at the triumphal entry. We could could fast forward to later in that week, the Passion Week. Uh, Again, we're not going to turn there. I think you're familiar with these stories. Uh, But fast forward to the the Last Supper in John chapter 13. This is Jesus' last chance to be with his disciples, his last chance to display his glory to the disciples, his last chance to show the glory of Yahweh to his disciples. And what does he do? He girds himself, takes a towel, and washes the disciples' feet. Wipes them with the towel with which he was girded. Disciples, here is my glory. Not flashing lights, humble service. Compassionately working for other people. 
And of course, the culmination of his glory and his humility later that night, what Dwayne preached on this morning, uh, 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, we have been healed. The cross of Jesus Christ, God's wrath poured out on him. God becomes the just and the justifier. In one act, he works and fixes all his people. That's the radiance of the glory of God that shines the brightest. Uh, The fact that although he is the God who sits on a throne, lofty and exalted with the train of his robe filling the temple, the fact that he is that but came down to work on behalf of his people. Although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. Being humbled, he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. That glory shines brightly. Uh, We get insight into the heart of God. We get a, a peek into the heart of God. We see his glory come out in Jesus Christ. All his his omniscience, his omnipotence, his passion for holiness. And we see his heart of love and compassion for the wicked. He loves us, so he works for us to do what we cannot do for ourselves. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he demonstrated, he acted. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. He does the work. We get the help. He gets the glory. So now I want to spend the second half. That's the first half, part A. Uh, so now I want to talk about what is our response to this glory. So that is the glory of God seen in the, in the Scripture. His working for his people out of compassion. So what is our response to this, How should we respond to this glory? Again, we want to make sure that it's not just a head knowledge. It's not just something that we learn, okay, now we're going to do really well on Bible trivia next week. It's something that we learn and that we are doers of the word, not just hearers who delude themselves. So I originally had 16 responses uh, that we should have, and I thought that might be a little overkill. Although it is Memorial Day tomorrow, you can sleep in. Uh, but I narrowed it down to five responses that we should have to God's glory. So the first response to God's glory is to see God's glory. To see God's glory. Humans by nature do not like or want a God of humility and compassion. That's not what they're looking for. They're not looking for a God who works for us. Turn to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. So this is the triumphal entry, John chapter 12, verse, uh, let's start in verse 12. It says, On the next day the large crowd who had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Skip down to verse 42. So after these things, Jesus rides into Jerusalem humbly. Verse 42, Nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. And that word for approval here in Greek is doxa. It's the word for glory. They loved, literally, the glory of men rather than the glory of God. They don't want humility. They don't want a God who comes down. They want to be raised up. We don't want to be put out of the synagogue. That's lowly. We want to be high. We prefer, we love the glory of men rather than the glory of God. That's why Jesus was a stumbling stone to the Jews. They wanted power, not humility. Even Peter, Jesus tells Peter, he tells him, I'm going to be crucified. Peter says, may it never be. That's not glory. That's not going to happen. Peter, Jesus tells him, get behind me, Satan. 
You're putting your interests on man's things, not God's things. Even at the, at the Last Supper, Jesus is watching the disciples' feet. He comes to Peter, and he's about to wash Peter's feet. And Peter says, no, you will never wash my feet. That's not glory. That's not what a God does. Jesus tells him, if you don't accept my humble service, you have no part with me. Human nature is, that's not glory. Dwayne looked at this this morning, but 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, the message of the cross, the message of a God humbling himself, coming down to work for his people, is foolishness to those who are perishing. Why, why is it foolishness? What would cause someone to stand before the mountain of God's glory and say, that's foolishness? Think physically, you know, th think uh, illustration. What would cause someone to stand in front of something glorious physically? Like, let's say the Grand Canyon. That's the most glorious physical thing I can think of. What would cause someone to stand before the Grand Canyon and say, this is stupid, this is foolishness? Blindness. That would cause someone to think that. If I'm explaining the Grand Canyon to a blind person, I say, well, it's a, it's a, it's a hole. It's glorious. <laughs> they say, this is foolishness. This is stupid. This is moronic. It's a hole. It's not glorious. So take that illustration. What would cause someone to stand in front of God's glory and say, this is foolishness? Blindness. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Spiritual blindness. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse three says, "And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God." So unbelievers, those who see the gospel message as foolishness, don't see the glory of Jesus Christ. They look at the message and say, foolishness, not glory. They're blind. And they're willingly blind. John chapter 3 says that Jesus came into the world as light to open people's eyes. And it says people hated the light because they loved the darkness, because their deeds were evil. So people are blind to the glory of God in Christ because they want to be blind to it. They don't want to see it. It means they're going to have to give up their sin, give up their own authority. So what happens in salvation, verse 6. So verse 5, they're, they're, verse 4, they're blinded. Verse 6 says, For God who said, Light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So what happens at salvation, according to verse 6, is the same God who said, let there be light, back in Genesis 1-3. There's complete darkness. God says, let there be light, and there was light. That same God who said that says in your heart, let there be light. And you're flipped on in your heart to see the glory of Jesus Christ. So then the, the glory of Christ turns from being foolishness, now you see it for what it is, as the power of God to salvation. So that's our first response to the glory of God. It needs to be, see the glory of Jesus Christ. And if you don't see God's glory when you look at the gospel of Jesus Christ, you need to start there. Maybe the God who said, let light shine out of darkness has never shown in your heart to give you the knowledge of the light of the glory of Christ. And if he hasn't, then call on him. Repent of your sin. Turn to him. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Ask him, please come into my heart. Shine the light so I can see your glory. That's our first response. We're not going to make it through five responses. I shouldn't have told you there was five. I could have just done three. <laughs> Next time. That's our first response. See his glory. Our second response to God's glory should be to praise God's glory. 
The reason God displays his glory is not just so that it can be seen. We just say, oh, okay, cool, I see it now. Oh, nice, there's God's glory. He shows us truths about himself and shows us his glory so that we would praise his glory. The purpose of all theology, learning about God and his glory, is never just to amass knowledge. 1 Corinthians 8 says knowledge puffs you up. It doesn't puff God up. Knowledge puffs you up. The purpose, you know, who, who knew a lot, the Pharisees knew a lot. Didn't help them out. James 2 says the demons have great theology. You believe that God is one? So do the demons. Satan has better theology than we might ever have, but certainly than we have now. Theology is never an end in and of itself. We learn more for the purpose of praising more. The, I thought I came up with this saying, but then I googled it, and like 50 other people have too. But the purpose of theology is doxology. The purpose of learning about God, of seeing his glory, is to praise his glory. John chapter 4, what God wants are worshipers in spirit and in truth. So we need the truth, we need the theology, so we know that what we're worshiping, we know what it is that we're praising. But our goal in the truth is praise. Ephesians chapter 1, let's turn there. Try to go real fast if you can. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1. There's some great theology in Ephesians chapter 1. Some great doctrines. Look at verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. There's some, that's packed full of good theology and good doctrine. God has predestined us. Uh, he's adopted us. There's a lot of good things in there. Look at the purpose, verse 6. He did this to the praise of his glory. That's why God did those things, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him. Verse 11, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. Verse 12, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. One more, it's in here a lot of times. One more, verse 13. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who's given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. So the purpose of seeing his glory, knowing his glory, understanding his glory, is to praise his glory. Paul starts all this this paragraph in verse 3, with blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's, this is a sentence of praise. That's Paul's intention with it. Not just theology, not just doctrine, but praise over this doctrine and theology. And it's what Gil's been talking about in Revelation 4 and 5. We're going to spend eternity praising God's glory. So number one, see God's glory Number two, praise God's glory. There is no number three. Number four is imitate God's glory. So we see it, we praise it. Number four, we imitate it. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. 
So as we see the glory of God in the face of Christ, and we behold that glory, and we learn about that glory, a strange thing happens to us. We are transformed into that image. We see God's glory and his compassion and his humble service, and we become like that. We start to be turned into that. That's what Jesus told his disciples in Mark chapter 10, what we looked at earlier He says, whoever wishes to be great among you, follow the example of the Son of Man and serve. Get low. John chapter 13, after humbling himself and washing the disciples' feet, he tells them, if I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. So God shows us his glory in the face of Christ, his compassion, his service for other people. And he says, I want you to turn into that. We are Christians. That means little Christs. And he says in John 13, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. 2 Peter chapter 1 says that, in Christ, in, in, through the gospel, we become partakers of the divine nature. We no longer live like normal humans. This is an amazing thing. We get to partake in the nature, in the glory of God Almighty. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. New things have come. Divine things have come. We no longer prefer the glory of man. We start to not care if we are high and if we have power. We start to look to serve other people, especially our enemies. That's what God did in us, right? He didn't just, Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, well, you know what? Someone might actually give up their life on behalf of a good person. God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were sinners, while we were enemies of God, He died on our behalf. And again, that's natural humanity. When we're wronged, natural humans wrong in return. I don't have to teach my kids to do that. They're pretty nice when they're nice to each other. But when you wrong them, they wrong you back. But we are different. We imitate the glory of Jesus Christ. When he was reviled, 1 Peter 2, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten Jesus says, what use is it if you greet those who greet you? Don't unbelievers do that also? He says, what will make you distinct as my disciples, what's unique about your glory, is that you will respond kindly to people who treat you terribly. So we need to be transformed into the image of his glory. And again, this transformation comes from fixing our eyes on the glory of Jesus Christ. Philippians 2 says, Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. So we look at Jesus Christ and his glory and become transformed into that same image. Again, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, became a servant. So number five, so see God's glory Praise God's glory. Imitate God's glory. And the last one, uh, last but not least, is proclaim his glory to other people. Proclaim his glory. If you see the glory of God, proclaim it to other people. We live in a world surrounded by people who don't see the glory of God. They're blinded to it. They're at the Grand Canyon of God's glory and see nothing. That's where we used to be too until God shone in our hearts. 1 Peter 3, 9 says that we are to proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Proclaim his glory. And we proclaim his glory in two ways. Uh, The first one is what we just talked about, imitating his glory. You know, let your light shine before men in such a way that they might see your good deeds and glorify your Father who's in heaven. We live a transformed life and people begin to see the glory of God in us. 
They start to ask, 1 Peter 3, verse 15, they start to ask, what's the reason for the hope that's in you? You are different than everyone else. When you're wronged, you respond differently than normal human beings. What makes you weird? What's the reason for the hope that's in you? So we proclaim his glory, firstly, through our deeds. But deeds alone are not enough. Uh, Just doing good deeds will never save anyone. We must also use words. We must proclaim with our mouth words, the message of Jesus Christ. The good news is what gospel means. The good news of what Jesus did on the cross. Paul says, Romans 1.16, the good news, the message, is the power of God to salvation for those who believe. The words of the gospel are what God uses to shine in people's hearts to transform it. So, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Show with your deeds the truth of the gospel and proclaim the message of his glory. See his glory, praise his glory, imitate his glory, and proclaim his glory. And praise the Lord for his glory revealed in Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, uh, we praise you and we thank you for revealing yourself to us in your word for not... Uh, leaving us in the dark uh, about how to have a relationship with you or what you expect from us um, or how to spend eternity with you in heaven. But just thank you for clearly laying it out for us through your word. I just ask that you would help us to be devoted to your word, to um, seek your glory in your word, to look to know you better um, so that we can praise you better on a day-to-day basis. I just ask that you'd help us to be faithful and walk in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, in a manner worthy of your glory. We thank you for what you've done for us, and in Jesus' name, amen.